Hello, my name is Michael West. I've had the privilege of conducting research within the health service over the last 30 years to try to understand how we can create effective healthcare teams and organizations that deliver high quality care to people in our communities. I'm currently Senior Fellow in the King's Fund and Professor of Organizational Psychology at Lancaster University. The health service today is characterized by some very considerable challenges. Uh, we're all aware of the difficulties of finding adequate funding, the increasing complexity of the problems that people present with in the National Health Service and aging population, and just the complexity of the National Health Service overall. I think we're also in danger as we try to respond to those challenges of damaging the health and well-being of those who we ask to deliver health and care to our communities. So at least 50% more staff in the NHS report debilitating levels of work stress compared with the general working population as a whole. And something like 35-40% of NHS staff report being unwell as a result of work-related stress every year. And it's not surprising that only about 40% of staff say that they feel satisfied with the quality of care that they're able to deliver. And these circumstances do affect quality of care. We know that when people are under high pressure, feel high levels of stress, that that affects error rates, it affects people's ability to be compassionate, and in the acute sector, we know it's associated with higher levels of patient mortality. So that presents real challenges to us, not just in terms of running these organizations that deliver health and care, but caring for the health and well-being and the growth and the development of people who work in the NHS also. When the NHS was set up and created in 1948, it was a result of a society reflecting on itself right after a major war and there was a commitment made to providing free health care services to everyone regardless of their background, their wealth, their status, their prestige. And that I think reflected a core value of compassion in society at that time and we've continued to really protect and want to develop the health service ever since because of a core national value of compassion. And the vast majority of NHS staff made a, made a decision at some point to dedicate an enormous part of their precious, unique lives to caring for the health and well-being of their fellow human beings in their communities. So their core work value also is compassion and when health service staff are able to deliver compassionate care, patients are more satisfied and that in turn leads to higher levels of well-being and commitment amongst NHS staff. So we need to nurture cultures in the NHS where staff can deliver high quality, continually improving and compassionate care. And that I think at core requires NHS leaders to model compassion in their leadership. So what is compassionate leadership? Well, first let's understand what we mean by compassion. Compassion, I think, has four components. The first is, if we're with someone in, who is in distress, then the first element of compassion is paying attention, is being present with the other person. To use Nancy Klein's wonderful phrase, it's listening with fascination. Second is understanding the causes of their distress. And third is having an empathic response, feeling their distress at some level without being overwhelmed by it. In order we then, that we then have the motivation for the fourth step, which is helping the other person with their distress. So what does this mean for us in, in a day-to-day -day sense as leaders? It means, I think, that we hold in our understanding these four behaviors and seek to practice them every day through our leadership, in our interactions with those we lead, but also interaction in our interactions with peers and colleagues as well as with patients. So the first and most important step is learning to be present with the other. 
remembering to be present with the other, being mindful of being present and listening with fascination. And in that way we, we establish the basis for understanding of the other's position, which then evokes empathy, which then leads us to be in a position where we can take intelligent, thoughtful, informed action to help. So compassionate leadership, I think, is at the core of the sort of cultures that we need to create in the NHS and leadership is key to that and compassionate leadership is core to creating these sorts of cultures. But there are also five other really important areas that the research evidence tells us that our leaders need to focus on. The first is it's really important that our leaders and indeed everybody in our health service organisations are clear about the vision, the purpose, the, if you like, the narrative about the purpose of the organisations that deliver health and care. And that needs to be focused around providing high quality, continually improving and compassionate care to patients, service users, citizens, people in our communities. But it's not enough just to have a vision statement or a set of words. Leaders at every level must embody in their actions, in their behaviours, in what they pay attention to, in what they reward, in what they monitor, a commitment to that vision uh, in, and, and prioritising high quality, continually improving and compassionate care. Second, leaders must support all of their teams to translate those visions and purposes into a limited number of really clear, challenging, agreed, objectives or goals. It begins with the executive team in organisations having five or six clear shared goals and down to every team within the organisation and indeed for individuals wherever possible because when we ensure that people's goals and efforts are aligned around the core purposes of the organisation without overwhelming them with an infinite number of priorities and initiatives, people are much more motivated and much more are successful in the performance of their tasks. Third, we have to ensure really enlightened people management. This is absolutely critical. We know that staff engagement is probably the key predictor from the staff survey of the performance of our health service organisation. So we need leaders who are positive, supportive, authentic in the way that they interact with staff, who are open and honest, who are curious about how they can learn to lead better, who are compassionate and who are appreciative of staff. So fourth is the importance of leaders focusing on creating an environment that encourages staff to develop ideas and implement ideas for new and improved ways of working. We know that if quality is not improving it's likely to be going backwards. So it's really important that leaders are creating the conditions for staff to make consistent, continual improvements in their work. That means ensuring they have the skills to undertake quality improvement and that they have the time, the resources, the autonomy and the support to understand and feel motivated to see their jobs as being very much about innovating, continually improving the work that they do. And fifth, it's about team working, the quality of team working in our organisations. We know that only about 40% of NHS staff are working in real teams, and the rest are working in pseudo or dysfunctional teams. And the more of the latter sorts of teams there are, the higher the levels of errors, of stress, of injuries to staff, and indeed in the acute sector, the higher the levels of patient mortality and the lower the levels of patient satisfaction. So our leaders need to really focus on building effective team working and inter-team working in our health and care organisations. When leaders focus on these five areas in their day-to-day -day lives as the top priority in their work, then we begin to successfully nurture cultures that consistently deliver high quality, continually improving and compassionate care and ensure the health and well-being of the staff who are delivering that care. Exploring examples 
of healthcare organizations around the world that have achieved consistent cultures of high quality, continually improving and compassionate care reveals that there is a very specific leadership approach that is characteristic of virtually all of them, regardless of the country or culture. These are organizations that have developed collective approaches to leadership rather than command and control, directive, autocratic approaches. Indeed, when we review all of the case studies and research studies around the world into cultures of high quality care, we see that command and control hierarchical cultures are about the worst form uh, for trying to achieve high quality care for people in local communities. Collective leadership means everyone seeing that they have leadership responsibility within the organization. Collective leadership means shared leadership in teams. It doesn't mean that there's not a hierarchical leader, but it means that when the task requires certain skills possessed by people in the team who are not the leader, then the leadership seamlessly, naturally shifts to those people. It means leaders working interdependently across boundaries, prioritizing patient care overall, not just their own areas of responsibility. And it means consistent approaches to leadership where all or virtually all leaders in organizations are practicing their leadership skills with authenticity, with openness and honesty, with a commitment to learning to lead better, with compassion and with appreciativeness. So what are the implications of this for education, learning and development? We need to ensure that everybody who works in the NHS sees that they have leadership responsibility day to day in their work, regardless of their hierarchical position. It's really important also that those who are in training to become formal leaders recognize that their responsibility is to maintain an unwavering focus on the importance of high quality care as the purpose of our health services. It's also important that people understand the centrality of goal setting, agreeing clear challenging goals with those we lead and in our teams to high quality performance and to high levels of motivation. It's also about ensuring that there is a shared understanding of how fundamental good people management is to the delivery of high quality care. So ensuring that people understand that leadership is about authenticity, it's about openness and honesty, it's about a desire to learn continuously to lead better, it's about appreciativeness of others' contributions and it's about compassion. And we need to understand that continuous improvement, quality improvement, learning and innovation are really profoundly important. So those in training to become leaders must have the skills to do quality improvement, to lead improvement projects, to support innovation, to create innovation in teams, and to ensure that everyone has the teamwork skills, the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes to work effectively in teams, to create cohesive, effective, optimistic teams, and to work effectively across team boundaries, and indeed across organizational boundaries, so that we have our systems of health and care characterized by cooperation, integration, and a coherence in terms of the delivery of high quality care. Underpinning all of this must be a commitment to compassionate leadership. So developing the skills of compassionate leadership, of learning to attend, to listen with fascination to those we lead, to develop an understanding, a deep understanding of the challenges that they face in their day-to-day -day work, and encouraging an emotional intelligence and empathy in our interactions with those we lead. 
in order that we then can really help them and support them to deliver the, the quality of care that they're seeking to, de to deliver, to do the jobs that they're committed to doing. NHS staff represent one in 20 of the working population of this country. When they go to their workplaces and encounter compassionate leadership as part of compassionate cultures, they take that compassion back out with them to their families and their communities. And when the one million people who use NHS services every 36 hours receive compassionate care, they too take that compassion back out with them to their, to their communities. The potential implications of creating compassionate cultures in healthcare are therefore really profound for our society.